So first of all, welcome. Huh? Thank you. And great it's that we can. Uh, yeah, it's great that we finally meet. And um, I would love to talk about uh, your book, The Guys in Business, called here in, uh, in in the Netherlands as a book. So it's the the creating lasting excellence one st small step at a time in the English. Yes. Um, and um, well, my first question or thought was, I would like to know from you, what was the, the moment you sort of realized the power of Kaizen yourself that made you write a book? Uh, there's a couple ways to answer that. One is that uh, I, I work in a medical setting and we work with many people that are struggling with issues around weight and diet and health issues where they need to make life changes. And we were giving them advice that they weren't be able to take because the American Heart Association the, the, um, uh, re recommends 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And that's what we were telling people. And you could just see their faces glaze over. They, you, and I know what they were thinking. These are people working full time, taking care of children, sometimes elderly parents. They didn't have 30 minutes uh, a, a day. And all they realized was how little we knew about their lives. And so I was looking around for some, some ways to help people. And one day I saw a um, ad for the Toyota Lexus, which for five, 10 years in a row was the highest quality car in America. And I thought, well, maybe there's something about building a car I can use to help people build their lives, which led me to a book I know you're very familiar with called, called The Machine That Changed the World, which I thought was going to be about computers, but obviously it's about cars. And that's how I was introduced to Dr. Deming. Um, and the notion that uh, through very, very small changes, they could build high quality equipment during the war. Um, but on a more personal level, once I became very interested in Kaizen and got a book contract, I was, I was overwhelmed with fear because not only do I not like to write, but I only ha I had a deadline. So I thought, well, I'm going to use Kaizen to write this book because I hate to write. So I told myself, I only have to write one minute a day. That's all I have to do. And of course, the beauty of Kaizen is because the one minute was so easy, I didn't come up with excuses or rationalizations for not doing it. Um, and of course, what happens after a while is you forget to stop. So the one minute got me past my fear. So that, that was how I applied it personally and saw the power of it individually, but saw it every day in my work with patients. Because if I told somebody to exercise 30 minutes a day, they came up with all these excuses. If I said, well, can you move in place one minute a day as fast as you can while you're watching a television commercial, everybody could do that. And what happens is, as you know, with any habit like exercise, you hate it, and then you tolerate it, and then you miss it if you stop because your body's gotten used to it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, and exactly what you say, I mean, you, 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 you think, uh, I mean, uh, think the examples of, of Theoda and but still, if you then look to the, the success, and you have so many proof, huh? one of the questions I thought was to ask you, what do you think, you also mentioned a little bit in, in your book about that, is then the reason that top management leaders, industry leaders, think they should do something remarkable, you know, like innovation, yes. instead of choosing for Kaizen. What do you think is the reason for that? Well, I think at least in, in, in Western culture, I think we think big problem, big solution. And that if the problem's big, the solution has to be big. Um, and it just seems logical that that's the case. Um, except as any business, you, you can think of so many business examples where they took some big, huge step and it was financially disastrous. And then sometimes it even cost them the business. So it just, it doesn't seem logical that you can get to the same large goal by taking small steps that you can get with the large steps. Um, so it just seems illogical. Plus the more, um, what happens sometimes in business as well as in personal things is when a business is struggling, um, people are desperate and think that they better do something quickly in order to fix it. And yet I can give you example after example, and I'm sure you can as well, of companies that had breakthrough products and services by looking at something so small and trivial, it didn't seem important. And through this small step, they en ended up with revolutionary uh, products. There's a, there was a, I forget the name of the book now, but, um, 
but one, there was a study done at Harvard where they looked at companies that were at the top of their game and ended up essentially being marginalized or destroyed. And it was the same story every time. They got big enough that they started looking for other big products in order to satisfy their big customers and their big shareholders. And then some company came along with some small product that was essentially less expensive and just as adequate and essentially destroyed the large company. So unless, and the, the solution was that, that as, as you got bigger and bigger, you had to start uh, having small projects that were so trivial, nobody thought they would go anywhere because often those are where breakthrough products and services come. Yeah, clear. And the other side, I mean, one of the other questions I thought, if you take it from the other side, what do uh, manage the leaders tell you what Kaiser has meant to them? I mean, if they experience, if you go into it, what is the, the words they use? What is their the inspiration? How would you describe what they, uh, what they tell you about it? The biggest thing I hear, the gratitude that I hear, is that a couple things happen. One is Kaizen empowers each worker each day uh, to be coming up with ideas to improve the process or product. So you've got a lot, so the data is very clear, your employees are much more engaged, much more enthusiastic, much more proud of the product because they're looking at it each day. If I can give you one example, um, the one that was in the book and that I've heard several times is a Toyota worker in Kentucky was reaching into a, 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 a bin to take a bolt out to put on a tire and asked the question to himself, I wonder how much that bin costs. So he asked his supervisor, supervisor didn't know, but researched it and it was like a $40 bin, 40 US dollar. And, and then the foreman said, why are you asking? He said, well, I saw the exact same bin at a big box store, at a retail wholesale store, it was $3. Um, and so, but, but again, the miracle of that story isn't how much money it saved, but here was a man taking a bolt out of a bin and so committed to looking for change that he'd look at this bin as something where he could improve the process or product. So first of all, you get engaged employees. Second, the beauty of Kaizen is that every worker understands that you're continually, not constant, but continually looking for improvement. So when, you, when management comes up with an idea they wanna try, you don't get pushback, resistance, um, frustration because employees assume that we're always ch trying to change and improve. So it changes the culture and it changes employee retention and enthusiasm. Uh, everybody wins and it costs nothing. <laughs> Which is, especially also in these times, not a minor argument I would say. No? Exactly. And, and, some of the, some and, of the Japanese firms found that, th that they even eliminated any kind of financial reward for ideas because you didn't need to do it. People were seeing, seeing the value in what they were doing and yeah. the rewards were sometimes making it worse. Yeah, that's what you explain as well. I heard, by the way, also someone tell that as one of the speakers. It also confirmed exactly what you tell in your book about that. And, and, and Bob, I, um, I like very much, and, and when I give the book to people and I start reading, they love the first two chapters, especially when they say, I never thought about it, my brain works like this. So <laughs> in your book, you start with this idea of saying, you know, keep the amygdala asleep and get cortex alive. So. Could you explain a little bit in, in, um, in a few words the, the ascension, how the kind of why it is so successful uh, in, in for us as people, as human beings? Yes, be happy to. That there's a place in the middle of the brain called the amygdala. It's literally about the size of an almond. And it's where the fear mechanism in the brain lives. And so it and the cortex are busy uh, co uh, communicating with each other. So when you say, I need to lose all this weight by the end of the month, I need to make this amount of profit by the end of the week, I need to, the bigger the steps you set in your, in your thinking brain, your cortex, the more it triggers the amygdala, which triggers fear. And fear, as you, I'm sure you would agree, doesn't make anybody smarter. Because again, the more afraid you are, the more it's, it suppresses the cortex. The brain, this ancient part of the brain thinks you're being chased by a lion. So it doesn't want you thinking, it just wants you moving. Um, and so the more afraid you are, the less creative, the less productive you are. 
So if you can keep the amygdala quiet, then the cortex can busy being creative and effective and making decisions and uh, making changes. So if you make, if you decide that we need to have this, we need to roll out this new program by the end of the month, or I need to lose all this weight, or I need to get married by such, whatever the goal is, the bigger it is, the more it triggers the amygdala, the more afraid you are, the harder it is to create. So if you can make the steps so ridiculously small that the amygdala stays asleep, then the cortex gets to do all the amazing things it's capable of doing, and you're developing habits. Because the, the bad news is the brain's a creature of habit. The good news is the brain's a creature of habit. So um, if I draw two golden arches anywhere in the, in the world, people know that's McDonald's. And even if you've never set foot in McDonald's, you can tell me three or four of their products because they've shown you those commercials on TV over and over and over again, building the brand into your mind. So repetition is what the brain decides to store. So you're better off doing something one minute a day every day than you are doing it once a week for an hour because the brain doesn't, anything you're not used to doing repetitively, the brain doesn't commit cells to. So you can build habits while the amygdala is asleep. Um, yeah. is, is the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's not uh, something we like, but it's how we are created as human beings. This is who we are, yeah. correct? Yeah. Yeah. We used to yeah. think you could motivate people with fear very well. It turns out to be the worst motivator. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then if we then talk about, uh, let's take the examples. We have a lot of fantastic examples in your book. I love it. And people love it because that's, that's their life, you know. And some say, well, you know, it doesn't say me, but this one is mine. Or the others say, well, this one is mine. And I, they react on it. So... I love uh, hearing from you a few examples related to the different uh, topics. So if I, for example, say the atmosphere at work, uh, uh, how does Kaizen improve the atmosphere? Uh, could you explain in a few words what you uh, advise top managers, leaders to do? Sure. To practice. One of the things that we found in the research that made such a difference is if even as you're walking through the factory floor, sm smiling and keeping eye contact with people, with the employees that you uh, can be aware of, asking them about what they did on their last holiday, uh, remembering one of their children's names. Those small moments turned out to be so powerful in terms of creating a culture where people feel valued and respected. And again, it costs you nothing. So th those small moments during the day turn out to be very, very important. We found that in relationships at home and even more so at work. Do people feel appreciated and valued? How, much, how long does it take to say thank you um, or to send an email once, once a day telling an employee how much you appreciate something they did? Yeah, as you say yeah, in your book, I mean, people want to be seen and you really have to see them to get the connection. It's really great. And I, I can speak for myself that you sometimes forget to do that as a leader. You have your mail, you have your topics, you have the content, yeah. and you forget maybe the word relation with your people, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Even, yeah. even as you're walking from the car to your office, you're encountering the receptionist at the front desk and such and such. And those moments are very, very critical in terms of letting people feel valued and respected. A, a kind of a tangential experiment is when Walt Disney built Disneyland, he had a private contracting firm that was in charge of parking. And then one day he realized that the first person you meet when you come into the Disneyland experience is the parking attendant. The last person you see when you leave is the parking attendant. So he made them Disney employees and trained them how to really make people feel valued and appreciated. So that, that sense that each of those small moments matters is essential to Kaizen, but not something we usually think of in our day-to-day -day life. Clear, yeah. And if we then take a typical business topic, you also uh, uh, not afraid to mention and to take uh, uh, as an example for Kaizen is talking about savings. Huh? If we say uh, chapter, uh, talk about cost saving within the organization. Uh, also very clear examples. What is your advice in relation to, to create a cost saving culture? Um, that is, it's so crucial that, uh, pe that each person 
um, looks at each thing they're doing in terms of, is this the most effective way that I can do what I'm doing? Um, or like that example with Toyota and the bin, uh, are there ways we could do what we're doing um, and it's essentially higher quality at less cost because there's this false uh, dichotomy that we're either going to spend a lot of money for better quality or we're going to cut quality and reduce cost. But the whole notion of Kaizen is what can I be doing that is in the best interest of the customer in terms of increasing quality and reducing cost. So people are trying to figure out how they can save uh, each day um, but doing so again in the service of the customer. And it's, it's that mindset. At, at the Amazon uh, board meetings um, with the top management are there, there's an empty seat that is at the, at the table and that em empty seat is for the customer. And so whenever they're struggling with how they're doing the right thing, they look at that empty seat and say, is this gonna be something that the customer is gonna value? Um, and it's that kind of mindset. And as Bezos says, if you're focused on your competitors, then at some point you get complacent because you're doing a great job. If you're focused on the customer, you never get complacent because there's always got to be a, another way to, to, to make their life better. So it's a different mindset in terms of savings. And he also mentioned uh, this point about asking small questions. Yes. Could you a little bit, a little bit, a little bit? Yes. Because small questions: How small should it be? Big or small? What is the the ascension of asking small questions? Yeah. To me, the questions are one of the most powerful tools, and it's one that the research is baffled by, for reasons nobody's been able to figure out. Martin, the brain cannot reject a question. Any question you ask repeatedly, the brain has to pay attention to, and nobody knows why. I love demonstrating this if I'm doing, say, a five-day program in a hotel. And I'll say to the audience on day one, how many of you drove here today? Everybody raises their hand. I say, did you happen to notice what color car is three cars to the right of yours in the parking lot? They look at each other like, where'd they find this guy? That's the dumbest question I ever heard. I asked them the same stupid question on day two. They still look at me like, what are you bothering me for? By day three at the earliest, four at the latest, pulling into the lot, a place in the brain with the funny name of hippocampus will say to them, that fool's going to ask me again the color of the car, and they're forced to store an answer in short-term memory. The brain cannot reject a question. You see parents do this intuitively with a two-year-old on an airplane. They're trying to keep quiet, and they'll say, what color is this? Pointing to the chair. That chair is brown. What color is this? Pointing to somebody else's sweater. This is yellow. Now, what color was this? They know intuitively you engage a child's brain through questions. So one of the things that Deming did and, and Toyota has done, and we've now trained companies to do, is ask each a worker when they come to work each day to ask, just ask the question, what small trivial step could I take that may in the long run improve the process or product? Just ask the question. You don't even have to answer it. But again, the brain's a creature of habit. And what happens within a few weeks is you're sitting there at work with this question on your mind, and then you're looking at bins in terms of, is there a cheaper way that we could uh, still hold these bolts that isn't going to cost us so much money? So questions are the way you train people to be thinking quality all the time as they go through the day. Yeah, you mentioned also this uh, in your book saying the brains love to be challenged yeah, in a sort of way. That, that's, yeah, it's very, and I honestly, <laughs> I love the example you mentioned a minute ago. It works like that. It works. You're never done with it. You're always get exactly full yep. attention. Yeah. yeah. And if you take the, another example and the next uh, people could, could argue with you to put cost first before quality, but that's uh, a minor thing. But then you talk about quality in the next chapter. And you mentioned uh, the third words I, I left, uh, at least for me, were, were great, like uh, search for mistakes when they're still small, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. So uh, talk, talk about failures like that. So if I would ask you, talk about quality, what does Kaizen, uh, how does Kaizen work in relation to quality, in your words? The, um, it works in a couple ways because, again, what Deming would always emphasize 
is what you're doing in quality is that everything you're doing is in the service of the customer. And so, for example, um, we've had several articles in magazines, for example, a big potato chip company that still has the same size bag and the same cost for the, sig for the potato chips, they've now reduced the number of potato chips in the bag each time. Now you can call that whatever you want, but that's not Kaizen. Kaizen is always in the service of the customer. And so um, what happens in successful organizations is they're focused on um, how can we improve the experience for the customer as well as for the employee? Um, uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your, your qu qu question specifically, but um, qu quality is what they're always looking for. And one way of doing this is anytime there's a, a mistake, no matter how small, they try to address it there. And again, it was Deming and Taiichi Ono at Toyota that revolutionized the way we build cars as a demonstration of this. Um, because they put a cord at each step of the assembly line. And if you, you're putting on the right tire and you see scratches on the fender, you pull the cord, stops the assembly line, the supplier comes in, the engineer comes over. Let's see if we can fix it now instead of waiting till the end. And everybody thought it's absurd. How do you mass manufacture a product when you're stopping it to fix it? And it turned out to be the most efficient way to build cars and everybody's copied it. So the idea of being, if you can fix a problem while it's so small, it doesn't seem to matter, then um, you, you save yourself from big mistakes. Now the, the caveat in that, and this is where organizations are challenged, is how do you make it safe for people to bring their fears about mistakes, either a mistake they think they made or that they saw somebody else make, how do you make it safe for them to bring that to management without, being fear, without fear of being punished? Toyota had a sign in their factory that says, fix the problem, not the blame, which is, again, a simple way of putting it, but very hard to achieve in an organization where people feel safe to do that. Um, one of the examples in, in the book is about a, a uh, aircraft carrier where one mechanic couldn't find a wrench. He was pretty sure it wasn't on the deck, but he couldn't be sure because he couldn't find it. He told his commanding officer, who told the admiral, they canceled the maneuver. The planes that were flying over practicing landings went back to Virginia. The aircraft carrier pulled into the dock. Next day, they called the General Assembly, 1,100 sailors in full dress on their deck. The admiral came out, and, he, and guess what they did to this mechanic? They gave him an award. Now, obviously, he'd done something wrong. The, the wrench shouldn't have been lost, but... If we know there's a mistake and we can correct, we can correct it before it becomes so big we can't ignore it. And almost any of the big disasters, the um, Three Mile Island disaster, Chernobyl, Bhopal, um, um, the, the Gulf, the Deepwater Horizon thing in the Gulf, in every single case there were small mistakes. There were in that Gulf disaster that BP was involved in. There were over 200 small spills before that fateful night when 11 people died and we're still cleaning up the Gulf of Mexico. So it's just, it's just hard when you're busy and you're, and you're busy and, and you've got so many things on your mind to take these small mistakes and work on them before they become too big to ignore. But that's the essence of Kaizen. And then in relation also to, to leaders. So, well, you can say, well, management leaders leading their team, you managed also the risk of being this uh, leader focused on perfection and showing perfection compared to, well, you know, uh, uh, share your own failures. Exactly. Um, how does that work in your, in your opinion? Uh, if I am the leader, what should be my role to my people? I mean, I want to challenge them, but how should I show myself or get in, con in connection? Yeah, if, if you're willing to let your organization know that, that you've made mistakes in your life that you, you, and that here's how, here's how you became aware of them and corrected them, you're essentially role modeling that as opposed to creating the illusion of perfection. Um, the man who turned around Ford, um, he, he was a chief engineer in Boeing when they made the Boeing 777, the most successful plane that they came up with, which came in under budget and ahead of time. And it was a high, the only one they haven't had trouble with. Uh, he was hired by Ford. And the first thing he did is put everybody in the room and said, tell me about your mistakes. 
I made them at Boeing. I expect you're making them here. And nobody would raise their hand. And finally, one person raised their hand. They were having trouble with a tailgate in Canada and a manufacturing of a, of a new Ford model. And the first thing Mulali did is he started to applaud. The message being, if we hear the mistakes, we can help each other. So they tried to create a culture where people assume that anything we touch, we're going to have the potential to screw up. Let's see if we can find ways to, to avoid them. That's, you know, if you think about it, one of the great miracles in our lifetime, Martin, is the airplane. A typical commercial airline has a million parts. What are the, uh, is a several hundred thousand flights a day before COVID. What's the odds that anything built by humans, flown by humans, guided from the ground by humans could achieve that staggering level of perfection? But the entire air, airplane is based on the function that anything humans touch, they'll screw up. How do we build in mechanisms so that their mistakes can be corrected? So when the air traffic controller gives the pilot a message about speed and altitude, the pilot immediately repeats what they heard because they assume even something as simple as a couple numbers can be fouled up. Whereas we tend in business to assume that everybody's doing things right, instead of anticipating what mistakes could they be making, how do we, how do, how do we anticipate them, correct them when they're too small to make problems, and just look for the next mistake. So Great, thanks. Yeah. 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 Now, and then, uh, clear, then I'm, let's say, the leader saying, okay, I ask questions, people, I have small questions, I focus on quality, uh, I see them, and then you, you also make uh, sort of a switch to saying, how do you stay curious on small things, talking about innovation, talk about development. I'm really interested also to hear a little bit that angle from, from how you explain it, saying, how as a team, as a leader, should I inspire my team in the Kaizen way to stay focused on development. Could you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it's, you know, when, I, when I ask a group of people, how many of you consider yourself curious, everybody raises their hand. But curiosity is actually, in my experience, a pretty rare phenomenon. Because uh, I think the reason people raise their hand is most of us are in jobs where we need to ask questions to, to get data to solve problems. That's problem solving which is an essential skill, but that's different than curiosity. Curiosity is where you're interested in whatever's happening in front of you, whether it seems to have a function or not. So um, as a leader, are you asking people questions in order to help them learn things and develop their own internal process, or are you essentially telling people what they should be doing? So training people to ask open-ended curious questions uh, training people by the way you ask questions in terms of help, help, help me understand what are your thoughts about that. Um, those kinds of questions invite people to go inside and find resources, and that's how they're going to treat their, their subordinates, people they, they're responsible for. So can you ask questions that are so curious that people get uh, realize they need to go through the day asking, how can we do this better? What, what, what can we learn from this? As, as opposed to how, to how do I just do this faster? How do I get out of work sooner? Um, so to training people to be curious is a very challenging thing to do. And again, as long as the amygdala is on, the brain can't do that. Yeah. So you're trying to create, because the second chapter of Deming's textbook was called Getting Fear Out of the Workplace. It just didn't seem to help people stay creative and inventive and productive when they're afraid, even though for hundred years we've been trying to motivate people that way. It just doesn't work, particularly in, the, in so many industries where you need people's, it's, people's, it's the people skills and the creative skills that you're hiring, not the machinery. Yeah, totally agree, thanks, yeah. It's, it's great hearing that you add this as not as being the, the problem solver, but an extra point to stay curious and to, to ask, to say, yeah the things also question people about uh, what they do, why they do things, etc. Yeah. Um, and so, so many yeah. breakthrough products came from somebody who was curious about something that was happening that had nothing to do with the uh, function of the business at that point. Um, so we've got so many products from people, again, working for large companies, but who got curious about something else. Um, 
So uh, it is just, the examples are countless, whether it's the credit card or uh, Velcro or so many products that came from somebody saying, I wonder, I wonder about that. And they, they, had, they had the time and energy and somebody wanted to listen to it. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure you have had the product called the Post-It, you know, those little stickers that you put things on. Um, that was somebody work, he worked for, there you go, you know, worked for one of the biggest companies in the United States, 3M. Um, and he was in a church choir and the markers kept slipping out of the hymnal. And 3, 3M has this lecture series they do where engineers get up and talk about products that didn't work. Um, which, of course, of course it cr creates a culture where mistakes are considered part of the journey. And he remembered one of the lectures was about a failed glue. It just didn't work very well. And he thought, well, maybe I could use it. He invented the post-it. He couldn't convince 3M to sell it. They, they thought it was a waste of time. So what he did, which was brilliant, I know this isn't the question you're asking, but I love this story. He gave the post-its to the executive secretaries, executive assistants, to all the big top management. Um, they found it them invaluable. And then he said, I don't have any more. And they went to their bosses and said, look, this is a product that's very helpful to us. So the secretaries convinced the bosses. It took them two years to do this. And of course, it's a very successful product. So how do you make it safe for people to bring these crazy ideas to management? Yeah, that's a difficult challenge for us leaders to do that. Huh? Yeah. Yes. And let's talk uh, two, two very nice chapters. Uh, you, you have two different topics. One is sales. The one, you know, we always say salespeople, you know, they have like plates on their head because they can open doors. They put their hand in between, you know, etc. But what about sales? I mean, you mentioned also in sales, I mean, there's a lot of fear related to sales. If we have, so I can honestly tell myself, if I have to sell myself, it's not an easy job uh, sometimes. And uh, uh, I kept telling uh, bad things uh, to, uh, to myself, what you say, this is the wrong thing to do. So what yeah. is the right thing <laughs> if we talk Kaizen and we rate it to the topic sales? Yes, so many people find sales difficult because they're afraid of rejection. Um, and so one of the things we talk about in both books is that um, I'll ask people in audiences, do you think rejection is painful? Everybody raises their hand, of course, what a dumb question. And I try to convince them that's not possible. And they look at me kind of wide eyes. They say, well, let me see if I convince you. So I'll go up, say, to a woman in the audience and say, suppose I go up to Sally and say, Sally, would you like to go out with me Saturday night? And Sally says, you know, Bob, I'd love to, but I'm busy flossing. That usually gets a laugh. Um, and I'll ask the audience, is that rejection? Of course. Does that hurt? Of course. I'll say, well, let's see if that's what happened. I went up to Sally, asked her out. She gave me that lame excuse. As I walked away, which of these two voices got triggered by my amygdala? Door number one. Boy, Bob, am I proud of you. Nice try. That was gutsy. Could have been a little smoother. Next time you'll do better. I am so proud of you for trying. All the time, Handel's Messiah, the chorus from Handel's Messiah in my ears, congratulating me for pursuing my, my life stream. Door number one, Martin, or door number two. Boy, did you sound like a jerk. Who wants to go out with you? You're old, you're ugly, you're fat. Nobody likes you anyway. Which is more likely, one or two? Two, of course. So where was the pain in this person saying no or the conversation in my head walking away? So the research on sales is very dramatic that those people who um, have built in a new voice in their head saying that they're doing an act of service, they're giving people something that will make their life better, and that if people aren't ready for it, there's nothing that they can do other than try again. Um, so that's one sales t technique is to reprogram that voice. And we can talk more about how to do that. But it's ju sometimes just as simple as imagining you were chief salespeople in front of your group of salespeople. What would you say and what tone of voice to motivate and inspire them? Say it out loud enough times and enough varies person to person. And the amygdala builds in that handles Messiah voice. Now, the other thing is, uh, what many one sales technique is to make what you're asking people to buy so small in the moment 
that you're essentially not making much profit in it, but you're taking them from a prospect to a customer. So selling people something that's so, so good. There's a book called Influence, which is filled with 100 pages of these examples, um, giving people something so small that it doesn't seem very uh, consequential. But again, you've now established a relationship with them. <coughs> and of course, the other is using questions in terms of trying to understand what does that customer need and taking the time to do that in our haste to sell them something, we sometimes miss that step. You know, I've, I've interviewed some world-class negotiators, people from all over the world that negotiate for their governments. And they all tell me the same thing in different words. The purpose of any negotiation, which is what a sale is, is to create doubt in the mind of the other person about their point of view. No one will let you create doubt unless they trust you. And no one will trust you until they're sure you understand and respect their point of view. So if someone feels pressured by your sales technique, you've lost them. So, but if they feel you genuinely are trying to understand their needs and taking the time to do that through open, curious questions, then you're more likely to create a relationship because that's what you're trying to do. There's a, a Guinness Book of Record about the most successful car salesman in the world. He was an American named Joe Girard who during a 15 years period sold 14,500 full-size Chevrolets. Even during the gas crisis, when there was that huge embargo, he sold five cars a day. People called him up to make appointments to buy a car from him. Who does that? And if you look at what he did, all he did was call you the day after he sold you the car to see if you were happy with it. He sends you a card each month, postcard, asking if you were still happy with the car. He looked each day at the sale at the service roster to see who was coming in. If they were his customers, he'd come out to greet them, sometimes throw in a free set of windshield wipers. That's the, that's the extent of what he did. But he built a relationship with people. So next time they needed a car, he was the person they, they called from these small trivial moments. So we sometimes forget that in sales, um, it's a series of small steps that ultimately leads to a lifetime customer, which is what you want. What's, what we sometimes do is overpromise, and then we just so we can get the quick sale. And the next thing you know, our customers we've lost that customer because we couldn't deliver. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm immediately thinking about my own examples, thinking, okay, Please. this is how it works, and take my own small example. Think, oh yeah, of course, it's the attention I had. Sending out the message, calling when this is is wife was sick, and examples I have related to some customers more than five years, and that is a lot to do with exactly what you say. Of course, deliver uh, a little bit better than they want, things like that you can say, but also pay attention and really stay focused instead of to be too much, yeah, pushy things like that. Yes, yeah, and it's good to 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 build that in as a, as an understanding, and what you say, make it your own habit. Eh? That's that's a, that's a key element you mentioned also in uh, in relation to sales. Yes, Bob, a, a last topic you mentioned, um, especially uh, I think also very um, uh, actual in the Netherlands, uh, very very. Uh, important to especially uh, a business uh, industry is the absenteeism. Many programs focus on absenteeism, how to create uh, well, a better number, so to say. Um, and then um, you mentioned examples in relation to Kaizen. Uh, to Kaizen. Could you give us uh, a few examples again, um, how you describe in, you, uh, in your book uh, to, to battle absenteeism? Well, the beautiful, beautiful thing about Kaizen is that if you're um, making an environment where people feel valued and appreciated and engaged at work, then you've got this hunger to come to work because people want that, um, the absenteeism that we saw, particularly in hospital settings, uh, where, we did, where a lot of our research occurred, was if nurses felt that the doctors were listening to them, felt that they were getting, their ideas were being listened to, then uh, retention increased um, and and your and health in, in, uh, the employees in, in increased that uh, absenteeism essentially uh, was something something no, that they didn't have to deal with anymore 
that as long as people felt that they weren't valued and appreciated, um, all kinds of excuses would, would come up for not coming to work. So um, the things we've talked about tend to be the things we found were most useful in terms of keeping your employees engaged and even physically healthy. Yeah, I, I truly believe what you're saying here. And uh, yeah, and if I then would say also in your last remarks in the book, you say, if then the small steps don't work eh, and we say, you know, it's nice what they say, but there are some people or some departments or maybe a company, it doesn't work. What would be your advice to the leader saying, you know, I, I read the book or I've seen all the examples. I just asked my, uh, my, uh, the big companies to come over. I don't know, a couple of names I could mention to, uh, to do a reorganization, you know, stuff like that instead of uh, using Kaizen. What would be your advice saying if small steps don't work? Well, there's a couple ways to answer that. It's a great question. One is we're not, if we define Kaizen as taking very small steps to accomplish a large goal and innovation as taking the largest possible steps to accomplish a large goal, um, um, we're not trying to make innovation bad or wrong. Um, but we're just trying to say, are you free to choose between these two based on how much of a risk you can afford to take or what's appropriate? And what I tell people is if you don't use Kaizen, you're going to need to use innovation because you're going to have to take desperate steps to catch up with the companies that are using Kaizen. Um, so that's, that's one way of answering it. The other is uh, sometimes people learn Kaizen and then they want to go out and they want to use it with the whole company at once which is essentially turning Kaizen into innovation. So what's rec recommended is if uh, you're trying to introduce Kaizen into your culture, take one small team that seems that's essentially growth oriented and where, where, where the, the people are enthusiastic, let this small team use it, whether it's a sales team or engineering team, whatever, and see if they're gonna get results. If they're getting results, they're going to persuade other people um, as well. So to start Kaizen small, that way you don't get pushback from people that think this is ridiculous, it's too small, it's not going to work. And Deming used to tell um, companies he worked with that Kaizen, it took three years to create a Kaizen culture. Now, I think he was lying. But I think the reason he did that is because he knew, particularly working with Americans, that we're an impatient people. And if something isn't working quickly, we just go on to the next shiny, noisy thing that he wanted to lower people's expectation. It takes a while for the brain to acculturate to this because it's so foreign to our Western way of thinking. Again, big problem, big solution. Um, so uh, to start, start with a small group of people, let them become um, and see if, if, see if it's gonna work or sometimes it put it take two sales teams, for example, uh, and say, well, we're going to try Kaizen with one. The others just go about what it is you already know to do. Let's see where it takes us. Um, and that's how we're going to do that. So, in fact, uh, just to give you an example com that's completely foreign, one of my favorites, because we, 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 we can apply this on a grand scheme. Around 1900 in the U.S. and in Europe, agriculture was just uh, incredibly inefficient. Uh, half the population of Europe and the U.S. was working on farms, um, and, and the, the product was inconsistent. There were all kinds of problems, but the farmers were doing quite well. Labor was cheap. Land was cheap. Nobody wanted to change, even though agricultural science in Europe and the U.S. was leaps and bounds ahead. So at least in the United States, one guy from the Department of Agriculture went to one county in a small town in Texas got a farmer to turn over 70 of his 700 acres to these new ideas. Those 70 acres made $700, which in 1920 was a small fortune, made more money than the other 630. You can imagine what he talked about at the coffee shop the next day. And one county, one state at a time, the US and Europe have become the most rich agricultural baskets in the world. We now feed ourselves uh, and spend 1% of our population working on farms. But we, 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 there was so much resistance to change that they did it in very, very small steps. But the small steps grew very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank, 
Thanks a lot, Bob. We mentioned a lot of uh, examples and great explanations from you, Tengus. Do you have some a few final words you would like to mention again around Kaizen, or do you think we touched on the, the most topic uh, topics for now? Well, the only thing I would just emphasize, and we've kind of touched on it three or four different ways, is um, if I was, if you ask most people, think back over the last couple of days of your life, all the people you interacted with, those under your roof, other cars on the highway, people who took care of you in stores, restaurants, if, uh, people, uh, uh, other cars on the highway, if you were 100% convinced that any of those small moments, whether you let somebody in your lane or thanked a clerk or smiled at somebody in a hallway, if you were convinced it would have changed their lives and maybe the lives of people they interacted with, how many of you might have done something different? Everybody raises their hand when I pose that question. I say, well, can I convince you that whether you let somebody in your traffic lane or thank a policeman or or a clerk, you're going to change their life? Of course not. But if you don't go through the day with that assumption that those small moments can touch people's lives, what's the alternative belief? We all have relationships we put in the innovative category, people that loom large enough in our lives that they, on our best days, they get the kindness and consideration they deserve. <clears throat> uh, our neighbors, our friends, our family, important clients and customers. But think of how many moments we lose that opportunity to touch people's lives because the moments just seem too small to matter. So uh, Kaizen isn't just something that we do at work or something we do in terms of products, but it's, it's a mindset. It's a way of approaching life. You know, Mother Teresa said it quite beautifully because um, at one point she, she went to Beirut during one of their terrible civil wars and she went into a orphanage where there, because nobody wanted to go there, the three Red Cross workers had been killed the day before. Nobody wanted to go rescue this group of very uh, impaired children. And they asked her why she was doing it. And she said, small things with great love. It's not how much we do, but how much love we put into the doing. So again, those small moments, whether you're as a manager, leader, employer, parent, spouse, all those, it just makes life richer for us and for the people we interact with. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, thanks, Walt. It's, it's such a pleasure and honor to be, to collaborate with you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks, I think we, we, from the first moment we now uh, met, we start our discussion, we had a laugh, we had a discussion. I really appreciate um, your openness, your kindness, the time you spend with me. Oh, of course, um, I'm hoping this is just the beginning. <laughs>